What is up, everybody? Super Tuesday in the house. Pretty excited about tonight and uh, getting to collaborate with Mr. Fujikawa. He goes home tomorrow. It's been a spectacular uh, period of time getting to work together, talk about all things bonsai and life related. Feel super fortunate to have had this time with him. Uh, so a very big thank you to Mr. Fujikawa for uh, everything that he's given to Mirai. Got Sam on the mic this evening. Hello. Got even Jesus on the detail cans. Woo. And Josh producing the stream up above. So we've got this massive ponderosa pine. Now Mr. Fujikawa and I both apprenticed under Mr. Kimura. We became very, uh, I would say, institutionalized might be, not be the choicest of words, but we, <laughs> we became very adept at this level of work. And getting to work together like this is not something that I've ever seen happen on the international platform of bonsai. And so we wanted to take a piece that I've had in the garden. I want to uh, really try and maximize this piece of material. I needed the assistance of, of um, you know, the, the capacity to understand all the nuances of this. And Troy's not here, so it's, it's going to be me and Mr. Fujikawa diving into this piece of work. And for us, it's a really interesting experiment because there's always been a hierarchy in our work that's taken place. Now we're both here kind of applying our knowledge and our, our aspects of what we know about bonsai, the design, the styling, etc., to see if we can't make something really special happen. So um, we're going to come back to questions. I just want to touch on a few very specific points before we begin so that you guys know what to pay attention to in this initial structural setting. So first and foremost, when we start to talk about creating a really beautiful bonsai out of a piece that's this big, the reason that I chose this piece being this big was because it does have the capacity to be compressed and made into a size that magnifies the scope of this trunk, okay? And when we start to look at that, we're talking about the apex, which definitely has the capacity to be lowered to reduce that height, which gives us that reduction of height, expansion of the girth of that trunk, okay? And then beyond that, the ability to really be able to move these pieces and try and compress that negative space around the features of the tree, maximize the visibility, increase the power, compact the design. This is very fundamental bonsai work on a very big scale. So it's gonna be heavy, but this is very much within the realm of fundamental bonsai techniques, fundamental design understandings, all right? So we're gonna get started. I'm gonna walk you through some of the different nuances. The first one here, when we bend the apex of this tree, okay? We know that we're gonna be rotating this down. We're always looking before a big bend to be identifying where is there a weakness or a probable point where the tissue could suffer the maximum impact and focus of that strength and energy. When we start to look at this, there's two locations that have a real potential. Number one is right here, where when we start to roll, we notice that this is gonna wanna twist here. The most natural point for that to twist is right along this space right here. This is gonna be a location that we start to hone in on as we're lowering it to try and compress this as much as we can, really focusing on this region of the tree, watching its rotation. Now there's a chance that this region might be a little weaker and there's a little bit of sap right here that would say we need to be very careful, acknowledging that there potentially was some damage, maybe some deadwood underneath there that might give way when we apply that kind of force to compress that apical design. So we're either gonna get rotation here or we could see this piece rotate right here. And as we compress, these are gonna be the two points that we proactively identify and we're observing as we perform this work to know that as we're bending that, we're safe, we're in that zone of comfort, we're in that zone of being capable of pushing farther. This is really gonna be our focus. We will be watching the other tissue, but identifying that proactively on the front end, a very big important point, okay? Number two, we're gonna be pulling this piece in to occupy that negative space, shrinking down the width of the tree, but also filling in this space so that that trunk starts to become a real focal point of the design. Now when we do that, we're bending across a very long piece of tissue right here. Oh, sorry. Arigato, ne? <laughs> we're bending across a very big piece of tissue right here. There is any number of ways that this may distribute that force. But one thing we should recognize is that the direction of the bark, when we see those bark plates separate, the direction of that separation is insinuating the direction of sap flow. We're running straight through this piece here and we hit this junction right at this point where all of a sudden the bark takes off on a diagonal turn, which means that that tissue twisted in that location. So when we're bending, if we're looking at the strength of a straight run of tissue or we're looking at the strength of a, of a diagonal or a rotational tissue, the rotational tissue 
has the ability to open like a book. This is gonna be where we're gonna focus as we're bending this lowest piece, okay? So just cueing you into proactive identification to be able to head off some of those dangerous points. We're gonna go ahead and get started and we're gonna start first by eliminating this piece. Now when we eliminate a piece, keeping the movement inside of this to be able to create an interesting gin is of paramount importance. This is a valuable line in the design of the tree. So I don't wanna cut it back here and have just a little tiny stub. When I've got these kind of bends that really echo the movement that occur through this tree, I wanna keep those in that to be an enjoyable piece of deadwood. I'm gonna go ahead and step across here and I'm just gonna keep a really nice long, just a really nice long piece that I can work back. We'll come back to the deadwood if we have time. But let's go ahead and start from the ground up. We do the biggest movements first. If we have a mistake, if we have a tear, if we have damage, we're gonna alter our ideas on the rest of the tree to compensate for that. We always take the biggest risks first, see what we're able to accomplish and adapt our design concepts to that. I think I cut the wire too short. <laughs> so whenever you guys are doing this kind of this kind of work, you've always got to find a really solid point. Jesus, can you see this point right here? Just focus in. Yeah. Where we start to find that place where we can catch that wire and really have that really nice solid grip to be able to anchor this to. We're gonna take some of that strength off of the focal point of this just by the fact that it touches that trunk, but having that point where we can actually get a nice solid anchor is a really important piece of the puzzle. Yo. Okay, now when we're, when we're using rebar, mm. when we're using rebar, we always wanna make sure we always want to make sure that we've got a solid landing pad for the rebar to be able to apply that leverage to. Okay, now, as Mr. Fujikawa starts to bend, we're going to be checking over there. I'm going to take up as much of the slack as I possibly can right off the bat. はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。は
よしまだちょっと待ってねうん邪魔してるのもあるかなあるちょっと切る、うん、大丈夫よし行くよはいよはいまだチェックしてまだもうだいぶ中入れないと引っ張れないはい、はい、いくよはいせいやもうかかったうんちょっと待ってうんで、はい、前の枝のだテンションが大丈夫かところ見てちょっと待ってねうんこれの方がいいでしょうこっちは大丈夫大丈夫大丈夫全然だってこっちに回ってるから一緒一回多分ねテストするよはいよ<笑>うん<笑>もういいんじゃないここ切って。金またまだ。でもまた使うでしょ。うん。あとここ切るのも。大丈夫俺が押さえてるから。
回ストップねちょっと待っててねいいよいいよまだもう一回もう一回グーッと下げてもっと見てそっちで上でこっちかかってるからちょっとライアンストップね、うん、ちょっと待ってねでちょっと待ってうん思いっきり下げないとこれちょっと見て。下の。こっちだ。ああ。ちょっと。下げてみて。うん。いい。いいよ。わ、まあ、大丈夫だね。あ,あ。こっちは。空いてるけど、大丈夫。まだいける。これが。やっぱり引っ張るの角度がダメ。こっちじゃないとダメだ。そうだね。うん、一回それで、ちょっと待って、説明します。okay。so we got kind of something a little funky happening here。so there's actually a really old。break。right underneath here that's calloused up。eve can you see just the。the opening of that right there。okay。So when we start to look at this, zoom in a little bit closer for me. And yeah, bring it on in. Come on in here, nice and tight. There we go, okay? Here you see it. Okay, so basically what we have is a point where probably at some point this was compressed. And now this is the place, you can see the callus on li this lip, you can see the callus on this lip and it's opening up right there. We gotta be careful that that, that doesn't just come completely apart. So we're gonna be watching this area as the danger zone. これでいい。うん。ここで止めた方がいいな。これでこっちで。ちょっと待って。俺が逃がすから。いや、これはあんまり、あんまり、そういう力かけないで方がいいでしょう。はい。もうちょっとコントロール。うん。あの、ライアン
でもこれはちょっと変わってこっちで引っかかるんじゃないですかこっちでこここっちからそっちからね,ねこここうにしますかここね OK so whenever we're doing this kind of work you always got to be thinking about the changing forces because when that was up in the air where we were pulling to in the back was a great angle but as you start to pull that more and more forward this angle starts to come back you start to lose that pull capacity now we're going to change that to here pull it away from that piece of dead wood and get far more pull capacity but we're always changing as that compression is taking place 4番でいいんじゃないかけなくていけないんじゃないですかどうここにってことでしょ。Okay, we're going to use that structural wire. もう一本行く,行く同じところ同じところ<笑>もう足りるちょはいんもういいよこのまだいいまだいっていいよはいどのぐらいよいしょかけるかなかかるでしょそれならそうちょっと待ってねいいようんこのテンションでこっちから入れるよい一旦はい、はい、ここはキープしといてねるようにして、うん、まだ全然いけるかってる<笑>おちょっと待ってよチェックしてまだ大丈夫だねちょっと待ってねうんこっちでいはいもう全然、まあ、まあラインは綺麗に入ってる全然うん。綺麗 And whenever we're opening up an old place of damage like this you can see if Eve you come in here tight again Okay, it's opening up really really significantly Anytime we open this up We're just looking for that new white fleshy tissue to start showing. We're seeing just a little bit of white fleshy striation, nothing big. Still has a lot of room to go, but we're already starting to get to a point where we've compressed this to a significant degree.
Okay, now we're gonna work towards the bottom piece here. We're gonna bring this piece up and into that space that we're trying to disguise a little bit. We've got this piece that has this natural upward orientation. Now, if we take this piece on this big massive tree where we have a huge gap between the up and the down, and we lay this out flat and open all that pad up, it's, gonna ne it's never gonna close the gap, and we're gonna lose a relationship from the upper piece to the lower piece. So we're gonna leave this right in here and we're gonna tuck it right underneath this curve right here. We've got this beautiful piece of dead wood, tucking that right in underneath that curve right there. Using this piece in the back to fill that space gives the design depth. These are all the pieces that we're thinking about. Even before even making these moves, we were already talking about the branches and where they go. いいですかいいよあれがだけ通しちゃってあじゃあこっちから通すいやいやあったあったうんいいよこんなもん相当藤川さんの方が長いといけるでしょちょっと待っていいうん ね、危ね。うん、大丈夫、大丈夫。分かってる。ここでしょ。ここでしょ。いや、ここだよ。あそこ。ここ。ちょっとこれ閉めないと、それかけられないかもしれない。あ、ここね。お、オッケー、オッ
この辺に来るかな上の方こっちにうんこれそう上の方上の方こっちから来て、うん、そしてこれ下がるでしょどう下だったらこれそうだねここにないから、うん、ここに入っていくような感じでしょじゃあどこがいいここでいいこっちに、うん逆回りの方がいいんじゃないこ,こう回った方がここに引っ掛けてこっち回した方がいやここ引っ掛けたらそこはちょっと危ない弱い危ない危ないこれでそっちにちょっと待ってねうん中に行かないとよ、行くよ。はい。どう、まだまだ大丈夫。いいんじゃない、一回ストップして。はい、はい。おお、怖えな。ライアンそこで見てて。うん、もっともっと。もっと、こっちから。はい。ちょっと、行くよ。うん、いいせーの。はい,いよ。はい,いよ。はい。もう一回。ここに来させればいいんだろう。ね。うん、大丈夫。大丈夫だと思うよ。こっちもここ全部ギブスかけてあるからでそのまま見てってじゃあ、はい、いくよはいそのことだからそのさっき腸も下げて芋をつけたらどういくよはいおおいいねいいね<笑>うんこのぐらいこのぐらいうんもうちょっと,もっと下,げ下げちゃいけないと思うまだ上がっちゃう<笑>いくよはいはいそのぐらいこのぐらいか、うん、らいこれで離した状態だから、うん、さてそしてじゃあ今度これちょっと見てもらっていい、うん、この辺もしかしたらこうこっちに入れてまた出した方がそうだね,ね、うん、もう中に入りすぎはダメだね,ねもうこれはちょっと種類があるんで元の方で中に入るもっと中で一回こう、うん、そこをこう一回こっちで、うん、そうそうそっち行ってでそこから中に。はい。もうちょっとこう。もうちょい外出ないと、針金のラインでねじり込まないとダメだね。これ。うん、いいんじゃない。うん、足元がちょっと見えない、ね。少し見えるぐらいがちょうどいい。いあの目を腰するときに、うん。そうだね。じゃあ、これはね、ここでしょうん。これ流れ枝。それとも、これにしよう。そうだね。そっちの方がいいと思うよ。うん、こっちはあんまり強くないから。Okay, so now we're just kind of moving all of these pieces into these spaces. First of all, the piece in the back, giving us that depth right through that negative space in the center of the trunk. We don't want that centered. So from this solid point and this solid point, we don't want it right in the middle. We'll fix that when we come back and wire it. It's, it's for the most part in the place it needs to go, probably a little lower. This piece right here, sitting around the base of the tree, We took it into the space and brought the tips back out, which shortened that length, allows us to see the base of the tree and again play inside of that negative space to compress and create that power. So, what we were just talking about is which branch is going to give us that defining movement, that length in that defining branch. The one that he's working on right now, we're trying to occupy this space. 
tuck it right up underneath that like we talked about. <coughs> but for this piece, the lower branches are weaker. We actually have a better branch here to give us that flow and that's where we're gonna kind of lean on for the length of this design to be able to get, generate that kind of asymmetry. で、これを。もっと、もっと上の方じゃないですか。そうそうそう、そのぐらい。で、こういう風になればいい。そうそうそう、そのぐらい。で、こういう風になればいい。そうそう。じゃないですか。じゃあ、いいね。これで。そして、
not a lot of the world really gets to see underneath, sort of behind the curtain of what's happening. Uh, but when you see this kind of work where we both are very familiar, we both do this kind of work in our own practices, we, we kind of were raised, if you will, or groomed to be able to do this kind of work and do it proficiently, getting to see two people who can collaborate on a tree like this seemed like it might be something kind of interesting. I think we're both kind of feeling our way through it because we're both used to being the leader and kind of being in charge. So you can kind of see some of that give and take happening. Uh, but that's, that's really where the learning experience is for both of us. And we kind of talked about that, but I think we both were just really looking forward to getting to try, experiment with what this looks like. Yeah. Uh, Gabe wants to know if you will continue to bend these branches more over time. I mean, it depends on how much, we, how much we're able to accomplish tonight, but probably I would say this is the first. And any time that you style a tree for the first time, you can never take it 100% of the way there. So the ability to continue to shrink this down as we get better back budding, as we start to get the shape established, as the tree mends its wounds from this initial styling, absolutely, I'm assuming it's going to be bent far more in the future. Leonard wants to know how much bending is too much for, like, how, how, how heavy is too heavy a styling? I mean, as long as the tree doesn't die or suffer ill impact, then I would say you've done enough. And this is where you kind of walk that line of saying, all right, I'm going to make this tree the very best it can be right now with all of the tools that I have. If that becomes the next starting point, the next time you touch it, you make it the best it can be at that point, the best it can be at that point. To a large degree, I think a lot of people tend to have, tend to have the fear that in terms of styling, there's some threshold, right? The threshold would be in a branch when we go too far, expose too much of the tissue and it can't conduct water. The threshold would be when we have to do superficial moves to make it look finished and the tree's not ready for that in terms of its structure. But as far as just respecting the material and taking it as far as you can, as long as each branch is handled and handled with a mature understanding of that vascular tissue, then you can't go, you can't go too far because the tree's going to tell you its limits. Quarter to quarter, isn't it? So it's stuck. Quarter to quarter, isn't it? Yeah. Four more. Uh, Gabe wants to know how long will the tree be allowed to rest after this and what's the next step? So the tree, in terms of resting, we'll, we'll let it definitely push out with new growth next year to make sure that all is good. Um, and then we'll wait until that growth hardens off until we've hit a seasonally appropriate time to be coming back and doing further work on it. But I would say if the tree shows any kind of weakening, then we're going to give it more time. If it grows vigorously and doesn't show any, any kind of sign of detriment to the styling, then we can, do, we can push farther faster. So it's all up to the tree. The tree carries the load. You read the tree. Um, Dan wants to know, how long do you think these large bends will take to set? Well, so this is the interesting thing about a pine that is meant to bend and is adapted to being, being capable of being bent, tearing, and patching its damage very quickly is the bigger the bend that you make and the more to the degree that the branch thrives after that move, the more damage that you do in terms of stretching that tissue, the faster callus forms around that and holds that bend. Uh, Terry wants to know where did this tree come from? So this is a Randy Knight special deluxe, super duper, <laughs> who knows how he got it out of the mountains kind of a gig. And um, I, I couldn't tell you where it comes from. He doesn't divul divulge that to me because I've got That's too big I of thought. a mouth. Yeah. Um, so Jeff, this is about the, um, that wound that was reopened. Um, Jeff wants to know, can an opening like that fail a few hours or days after the bend is made, like coming into the studio tomorrow and finding that it has split open overnight? Not typically. That's a great question, but not typically on a ponderosa. That's not something that we generally see on a ponderosa. Something like a limber pine that has a lot more capacity to snap and break, uh, you might see that happen. Um, and that's really where you've got to know the characteristics of the tree and be very careful in terms of pushing it to the degree where if you walk that line and then it does continue to stretch, that you're not going to come back and see that happen. But again, if you're trying to push the tree to that farthest realm of advancing the shape and the design and technically working that tree, you may hit those points where you learn those thresholds. Every tree is going to be a little bit different, but inside of that, that's how you start to recognize your boundaries the next time you work a tree that has those same characteristics. And again, 
Just because it's a ponderosa pine doesn't mean it has unlimited bending capacity. There's a lot of damage. The branch that Mr. Fujikawa was working in the back has some real damage on it that we had to be really careful about. He didn't see it at first. We continued to kind of work. Then he acknowledged that it was there. Those are the kind of things that when you're doing a big tree like this, because the scale is so big, it's hard to, to notice and acknowledge all of those pieces. And that's where really collaborating can be pretty powerful. Uh, next up, this is a little bit off of what we're doing tonight, but a bunch of people want to know. Mel asked, um, how are you going to pot this in what, and how are you going to make it stay upright? So <clears throat> this tree is actually, in terms of repotting challenges, this tree is actually a pretty light challenge in my mind. Just based on the fact that the base is there to support it, there's a lot of room to anchor. It's a big tree, so it's going to be a larger pot that gives us a bigger footprint. So when we start to look at all the factors, this isn't a dramatic this isn't gonna be a dramatic repot. Chances are the upper portion of the soil, you've got the base down below. There's a root pad there that we can just fold down. And you guys have seen me do that on, on Mariah Live several times, where we just sort of tease that out, fold that down and recreate the new top profile of that soil mass. So I'm not at all, I actually look at this and I'm like, thank goodness this is gonna be a lot easier than some of the other things that we get the stupid idea to do on Mariah Live. <laughs> uh, Rafi wants to know, uh, does this design have a defining branch? He's trying to guess if it's going to be a harmonious or tension design. So I think the defining branch is down there, but I don't know that we feel completely confident in which one it's going to be. And I think Mr. Fujikawa is getting ready to kind of tease that out. We've talked about it being multiple different branches. I think we just need to see what happens, see which one's going to be the better of those. Uh, Bill wants to know, do you not need raffia, raffia for these bends? I would say you don't need it, and in fact, you don't want it, okay? Because when you talk about raffia, you're talking about applying a force on a point and compressing that point so that it doesn't break, right? But when you're talking about a pine that's very soft, that tears instead of breaks, if you apply raffia to it, the raffia doesn't stop this tearing from taking place, right? And so if you can't see it, then you have no notion of the threshold. For example, the lip that opened up over there, it started to open up like this, right? If you covered that in raffia, how do you know when you've hit the white tissue? How do you know what the popping is? How do you know when you've started to get into the actual water conductive vascular cells? That's where raffia on a stretching tree, on a pine that elongates, that stretches, that flexes instead of snaps, is really detrimental. I think we overutilize and kind of abuse raffia as a tool. We think it's gonna save us in every bending operation. And that's not true. In fact, it would be very detrimental to be using it here. Um, Gary O, I think he just wants to confirm you're going trunk, right, everything else left. Though maybe that's reversed because he's looking at it on the screen. <laughs> Definitely trunk, right, yes. defining branch, right, apex. We don't know, but there's capacity for dynamic in this piece for sure. David wants to know, are there any branches in the apex area on the right side that could be lowered? Yeah, we're just getting there. You just got to give us a little bit of time. This is a ginormous scope of work. We just got a couple more questions, and then we'll let you get back to it. Um, we have a couple questions about that uh, gin that, where you had made that first cut. With Terry wants to know, with the gin crossing the trunk, are you concerned? Um, would you possibly want to shorten it? And then Su Sujata, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, um, says, by bringing the lower branch and you've created a circle, is this OK in terms of design? Oh, uh, right here? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so this, first of all, won't be so long that it crosses the trunk. We just leave it long, because when we start to break it back, we know that as we're breaking it back, we're probably going to be ending up much shorter to tease out that character. So we always leave it longer before we start that reduction process. As far as that circular form, I'm guessing once we start wiring, you're gonna watch that disappear. And if it doesn't, then we're gonna change the structure to trade off and move that round sort of circular form out of the design. Uh, Scott wants to know. Hey, hang on oh, just one sorry. second. Nee, so, hmm? so, this is where? So, here? Yeah, so, here? Yeah, so, here? Okay, I'm ready, Sam. Cool. Uh, Scott wants to know, with this heavy of styling, how long will the tree need to recover before considering a first potting? Mmm, yeah, that's a great, that's a great, great question. Um, I think it is very tough to know. And again, we're going to let the tree tell us what, what it has the capacity to facilitate by the strength of the growth af after such a dramatic styling. Okay, so 
you know, when you guys are watching this, it seems super gnarly, but you have to recognize that this tree is, is very healthy and recovered from the, the collective process. And this is, this is the kind of heavy work that has to happen for a tree like this to become a bonsai. You can't gradually bend this, just a little bit at a time. You, you have to perform that first piece that sets that bar here. You let it grow on that, you then evolve it and set the bar here. And this is how you build a tree like this. And we say this all the time, pines are built, not created. We're definitely in a creation process because we have so much more built on the tree already, naturally existing. But we are definitely gonna have to focus on making sure that this tree thrives from this operation. It will go into a greenhouse. All of that consistent care is gonna be worked out. So that's really where our focus will be after this piece of scope of work. Uh, Bill wants to know, are there any compensating things that will be done for watering the tree with the angle it's now in? Um, water very carefully. Uh, and then um, we will just take this last question and then let you guys get back to it. Rafi wants to know, is this, is this monster staying outside or will it need protection? Now he knows why we're building a new greenhouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, that's right, Ravi. Um, no, this will definitely is not a piece that I think I would put back outside because it's just poor form for a tree that you've taken to, I would say. We're, we're not going to push this to the brink of survival by any stretch of the imagination, but we're definitely going to tax this tree to a point where putting it outside would be an unpredictable outcome. And from that perspective, we don't ever roll the dice on a tree when we start to style it to this degree. We make sure that we take good care of it. We ensure its health and its successful recovery. This will have to be greenhouse just, and nothing that's happened yet is super damaging or scary or there's, there hasn't been any risks, right? Like, uh, and that's really why I wanted to do this with Mr. Fujikawa, because when you're working with somebody that just naturally understands that threshold, then you're able to really kind of push a little bit farther, push each other a little bit farther, and, and this is a piece that the work so far has been relatively smooth and relatively easy in terms of what this, what this tree could potentially tolerate. But inside of that, yeah, we need to give it the benefit of the doubt and be respectful. Cool, so I'm gonna let you let me know when our next question block will be. Fujikawa-san, what do you want to say? Yeah, well, I wanted to collab with Ryan あの、ちょっと仕事、世界大会の時とかにこう手伝ってもらった時に、あの、言葉はまあライアンは話せるけど、同じその so I asked him if he had anything to say, and he just said, you know, when we, so Mr. Fujikawa was a demonstrator at the World Bonsai Convention in Saitama, Japan, in 2017, and um, during that time, there was just a moment on stage where he needed a little bit uh, more of a helping hand, and even though I was translating, I kind of hopped in there, and, you know, we speak the same language in terms of bonsai actions. And when you think about that, you think about sort of bonsai language, most people tend to assume that that is a verbal language. But there's also the understanding of the tree's nuances, styling nuances, tolerances, techniques, angles, applications. So when you say stop, you know, or when I'm using the rebar to lower and we're dealing with a sensitive area, he doesn't have to worry about me just cranking on that thing and tearing off the top. Inside of that, there's a lot of freedom to push very far because it's a very accurate application of technique. So it was at that time that he started thinking, man, it, would, it could be very interesting to come to Mirai and kind of work together, see what we could do when we both applied our techniques and knowledge to a tree together. And that's kind of how this whole thing was born.
<笑>そっちの頭のバランスはちょっと難しいかもね、うん、こっちからこっちから見るとね、うん、難しいけどまあ昨日の話したことだしない<笑>そうだね<笑> so, so,、uh, over the after Thanksgiving at Taft and Mr. Fujikawa and I went to、uh, Yosemite which if you check out our Instagram there's some pictures from our trip on there <笑>
convoluting everything. I think that's a big mistake people make is that you put movement in every piece of the tree. The younger branches, the tips, are a relatively untainted, undamaged, un mutilated part of the tree and handling that as such is very important. Now the way that the tips are handled, that nice smooth, just a nice smooth arc and the needles are placed upright, this is a fundamental aspect of pines. I think you're going to see that consistency across this tree as a way that they're growing towards the light. You show that consistency, it removes some of the artificial nature of having changed the orientation of the foyer mass in Fujikawa. Mr. Fujikawa spoke to this when he did the lodge pole on the stream as well where that little tiny bump up and that nice arc is how you take away the artificiality of changing the direction of those growing pieces. Um, Wayne wants to know what Mr. Fujikawa thinks about Ponderosa. Ponderosa wa dou? Ah, uh, mo very powerful de, ano, ma mouthpiece ga hoshi gurai, to i hare ga ne o, ano, hoshi gare yo ne. He said they're super powerful and they demand a lot of, of strength when you do the work to the degree that he almost wants a mouthpiece that he can bite down on when he's <laughs> bending the branches and stuff. Particularly on a tree like this, I mean, we're sweating because it requires a tremendous amount of force to be able to start taking action on uh, the branches that have been in a position for as long as this tree has been in existence. And it's, it's, it, it is, it is a very durable species, but it's a very rugged, very demanding, physical, heavy, thick uh, tree. And to be able to work with that and work inside of that is the crux of Ponderosa. That's the key to being able to work with them well. And I would also say inside of that, being able to understand and play on that flexibility and that tearing capacity and knowing where to look. We started the stream off proactively identifying those points where Mr. Fujikawa and I had already talked about where is the focal point of this force going to occur so that we can be watching it, the two of us, both over on one side, knowing that that's happening, feeling that as you bend it, right? Hearing it as it's being bent, being very proactive about stopping something bad from taking place. All of a sudden that opens up. We hadn't seen that wound, right? And so we start to play on that as now a malleable piece that we can stretch and flex. Uh, Farley wants to know, are the two foliage masses representative of two artists making the tree? <laughs> Have you thought about it that way? <laughs> 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 no, we hadn't thought about that. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, and then John wants to know, uh, how long ago was this tree collected? And Terry wants to know the approximate age. Yeah, I'm gonna say this is probably a 350 year old tree. I mean, this is an oldie but goodie. It's not super ancient, but it's up there in, in years to show a lot of struggle and strife. Um, it was collected, I believe this is the third year out of collection this year. So it's been out of collection for, and typically with these bigger trees, because they come out with such small root pads, it takes a while to get the root system fired up. It's got big fat buds, it's got pollen cones, it's kind of doing all of those things that we wanna see. And so it feels really good to be working it and starting to get into a position where we actually, where we actually can, can take some sort of step forward on this piece. Um, but it definitely, whenever you start working with material like this, um, you wanna make sure that it's got its best foot forward. The number still. このさ。うん。このこの柔らかさだけど、これじゃ細いか。これ8番。8番。うん、それでいいんじゃない。だってこれ6番かけて8番このつながるんじゃないかなと思いました。やっぱりね、本当に番線は番線のそのうん、パワ
that means that it definitely has a much more rigid vascular structure, thicker, meatier, beefier vascular structure. You have to use thick wire to implement the kind of movement and bends dependably that allow you to really dictate and change the shape. And so what he was saying is not having familiarity with it, he's just still trying to kind of hone in on where does that threshold exist where he starts to overwire versus underwire. And this is that big feeling out process. When you start working with new species, you go to Europe, you work on a mugo pine, you go to Europe, you work on a Scots pine, you come to the United States, you work on a ponderosa, a limber, a lodgepole. These are all different in terms of how they behave, the, the kind of wire that it takes to implement the kind of design you're striving for. It's a big, it's a big job being a bonsai professional. Uh, Kevin wants to know, what do the two of you think Mr. Camaro would think of this collaboration if he saw the stream? And do you think he's watching? What do you got to meet there to me? Mm, the, time, the, the time difference is probably a hindrance. I'm going to say the technology factor is also probably a little bit difficult. And honestly, he probably really wouldn't watch even if he could. He said he thinks Mr. Kimura would be really, really happy that we're collaborating. なんで喜ぶ。だって自分のその気持ちとか意志、まあ、DNAって言い方いいのか悪いのかわからないけども、それがこう残っていく。そのスピリッツが残っていく。Ah, uh, so he said, I said, why, why, why do you think he would be happy? And he said, because his his bonsai DNA is being is being passed on, and it's creating sort of. Uh, almost like a, a, a family, if you, if you will, or like a consistency to the DNA of his approach that he developed. And Mr. Fujikawa thinks that he'd be very, very happy about that, which I, I, I guess I, I probably concur with. I think he'd probably find this to be, he would have something negative to say as well, but he'd probably find it ultimately to be pretty positive. Uh, oh, go ahead. Okay. キムラさんのところで働あの修行した人でも僕もライアンもあの多分100% so he was saying, obviously, even though we studied at Mr. Kimura's, it doesn't necessarily mean that what we do is in any way the same, right? Because we're all individuals that have our own sense of what is good, what is bad, what is beautiful, what is not, our own sense of style, our own sense of technique. And inside of that, um, the collaboration of those two and the perpetuation of that growth amongst his apprentices is probably something that he would find to be pretty probably, probably find to be pretty positive and pretty special. Uh, Roland wants to know, was the tree positioned like this in the garden for the past three years? No, no, no. Sitting down on the box, we literally uh, had a lot of other things that we had to get done today. We brought this in 30 minutes before I had to go get taft bolted it together, came up with a very loose rendition, but this is very familiar to us. You have to, you have to recognize we didn't sit and ponder this piece of work for hours and hours on end. That's part of the whole discussion of getting to work together is you speak the same language, you carry the same bonsai DNA to a degree. There's diversity because we are different individuals, but inside of that there's also a commonality in the language that we just speak and share. We're just sitting here working, kind of doing our thing, working through all of the process. He's got a very different process. You can see he kind of carries some of the wire out and then he moves to another section. Now he's gonna come back in detail. Once I have those big pieces on, I like to finish a section and just start knocking it off. Boom, 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 boom. So we work differently from that perspective. Rebar action, awareness of damage, all of those things. You saw a very common uh, methodology, wire, pulling wire, using the rebar. We can both do that very proficiently. It's not, that's not foreign to us. And so you get to see those commonalities. You get to see those differences. Very, very valuable. I'm learning a lot. Uh, John wants to know, what species in Japan is most like a ponderosa? 
、どの種類はポンドロスと一番近くに似てる。ハイマツじゃない？うん、まあそうだね。うん、ハイマツの黒、黒だね。黒のハイマツ。黒。黒のハイマツ。でも黒マツじゃないでしょ？いや、黒マツだよやっぱり。黒マツっていう。うん、黒マツだけど、うん、その配症が入ってるっていうの？配症はどういう意味？うん、その性性質、性格がある。はその性が高いあの成長してるのやつ。そう、雪の中。かで多い黒松とかは、うん、あのこういうふうに柔らかい。うん、so there's a, a species of pine in Japan that's not commonly utilized in bonsai that most people don't know about. It's called a haimatsu, which, which literally, although we, right, it's, it's not named after an English name for high being like this, like height. It's not what it means, but what it ultimately translates out to. Is, is a high elevation pine. And he said, in the, inside of the high elevation pines, there's a, a shiro, a white, there's a kuro, there's a black. And it's not a multi flush pine, it's just, it, it would be like a pinus nigra, an Austrian black pine, right? It's like a high elevation black pine. He said, this is very close to the high elevation black pine in Japan, the high matsu on the kuro, on the black side.、Um. Rafi wants to know what is the plan, if any, to connect the top and bottom parts of the design? I mean, I think that's kind of where we're sort of where we're having to dial in. And this is really where, when you start to see this, you put, it, you put the structure where you think it's going to go, and then you just start working. You just start chipping away and chipping away and chipping away and chipping away. And as you chip away, you get closer and closer. You learn more, you learn more. You start to see how this design comes together. He's going to focus down there. I'm going to start to focus up here and probably start working on the apical region to see if we can close that gap and understand that. I don't know quite yet. I don't, not, not quite sure. It's very funny, too, to be touching some of you know, the, a different thought process in the wire. Just in terms of where it's terminated, how it's, how it's put there, the, the stages that, that the work goes through, this would be, I would say, a very big difference. How are we doing on time? We are about an hour and 20 minutes in. Gary wants to know Will we be able to see the difference in the style of Ryan versus Fujikawa sections of the trees when it's all done? We'll see. We'll see. Technically, technically, you shouldn't be able to. We should be able to merge and mesh the styles, right? Because if you can. If you can perform bonsai proficiently, and this has been a big discussion as Mr. Fujikawa has been here, right? This notion of sort of the Japanese style and, and sort of what comes with that, and then the notion of this more rugged, complementary style to our particular native material.、Uh, and I think going to Yosemite had a big impact on both of us because it was my first time. But just seeing kind of the nuances of these preserved areas in the wild that give rise to, I think, the spirit. Um, that, may, that maybe is contained in our native landscapes and is trans, translated to or communicated to us in, in subconscious ways to a degree, maybe in more conscious ways when we're overtly aware.、Um, and, and so to, to get to do this at the, la, at the tail end of Mr. Fujikawa's time here, in my mind, is very, very timely in terms of you know, it happened serendipitously that this worked out and everything went well going to Yosemite. But, It's very interesting to be pursuing this now after having had the same exposure as of yesterday to a new place for both of us. We'll see. We'll see how they mesh. But you always want to, and, and bear in mind, as apprentices, you're not doing your work, right? Any, any apprentice who goes to Japan and calls the work that they do there their work missed, missed the memo. Like they didn't get the message, okay? Because you're there working to represent somebody else's work and to mimic and learn. That style as your fundamental starting point to dive into your own design. Now, from that point, Oikata no Tokoro de Tara, Nanen Tachimas Kaima. So, Mr. Fujikawa has been a functioning professional on his own outside of his apprenticeship for 16 years. I'm now in my 10th year. 
So we've been away from that system for a long time and had that opportunity to be functioning professionals, explore our aesthetics, explore our techniques. But when it all comes down to it, we also have to be able to, because we're dealing with client work, because we're dealing with trees that don't, don't always give the opportunity for wild, that do conform maybe to the bonsai form a little bit more, or do conform to a form that's a little bit freer, inside of that you have to be able to adapt and adjust your aesthetic. And that, that is, for people to think that you lock into something and this is what you do and this is how you do it, that's not a bonsai professional. That's somebody who's developed a train of thought that complements their abilities as a hobbyist or as an amateur. To be a bonsai professional, you have to be able to do it all. And anybody who isn't focused on expanding their breadth of ability and capacity to design to the greatest degree is missing some part of what it means to be a professional. And that conversation has been a consistent dialogue over the past 10 days as we've worked together and kind of observed each other's work and discussed it and kind of aired out our thoughts about it. It's been really, really interesting. Um, Ron wants to know if Mr. Fujikawa has an internet presence of his own. Fujikawa san, yapari naika internet to de shigoto minna misteru to ka. An Instagram. Yeah. Or Insta, or a... Facebook. Ah, um, a little bit, but I don't know if I can do it, but I think I want to do it. So he's done a little bit of it, uh, and in, in, in sort of recent months, he's been thinking and wanting to do more of it. But um, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Fujikawa honestly is, is kind of a one-man operation in Japan and has more work than he can ever possibly finish in terms of client load. Um, he's got his own trees that, much like Mirai, he doesn't often get to um, in order to satisfy sort of the needs of his clients. And the Japan bonsai community is very, very different than uh, the North American bonsai community, the European bonsai community, the Australian bonsai community, the South African bonsai community. It's a much more established framework and culture that a bonsai professional is functioning inside. And so in, where we have a lot of freedom to be able to pick and choose how we go about things, there's a lot more of a standardly accepted approach to the client professional relationship, the priorities and obligations of a professional, etc. And inside of that, you know, I think there's, there's probably some thought on his part, although I won't speak for him, about how can he maybe work within that or shift that a little bit. Just to um, make sure we heard it right, did you say that was the first time you had been to Yosemite? First time. Wow. First time. First time, which I'm, I was actually pretty sheepishly embarrassed to say. Um, <laughs> well, people in the chat are like, wait, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it, it was. And I have to say this. I have to say this. And I'll ask Mr. Fujikawa what his thoughts about it were. But I have to say this in terms of Yosemite. I knew it was going to be spectacular. I've seen pictures. I've seen videos. Um, but when you think about discussing the native North American landscape, to not go to Yosemite, you know, for, and this is, again, like I lived in California for, for four years during college. I spent a lot of time in the Sierras. I was always outside of Yosemite because you obviously can't collect there and I would never want to. Um, there's actually not that many trees that would make great bonsai there as much as people want to romanticize that. It's not the right conditions for great Yamadori. Um, but I never went because it was time away from being in the mountains collecting and kind of doing more bonsai related activities. Shame on me, shame on me. But, but inside of that, I think a place like that finds you when you're ready for it. And, uh, and this trip, for whatever reason, the same thing happened to me when I went to the bristle cones, the giant sequoias, and the coastal redwoods in, in one single trip in 2012. December, uh, almost the exact same week in 2012, got absolutely crapped on by a blizzard getting through Reno trying to get to the to the White Mountains to get to the bristle cones and um, you know found myself there through the blizzard in a fresh foot of snow nobody there in blue skies so we showed up in Yosemite the the rangers told us not to come because the conditions were so gnarly they got like uh, three or four feet of snow on over over the week up to Thanksgiving and particularly on Thanksgiving Day we went the day after Thanksgiving. It was mandatory chains. The, the roads were icy, snow-packed. Um, it, it, was, it, was kind of, it was kind of a nightmare. Not a nightmare 
I, I do have some pride in being a Colorado boy and having learned to drive in the snow, but there were so many people that didn't have that capacity that that was actually what was dangerous about it. Um, but we, we kind of saw the valley on Friday very briefly. There were too many people, so many people, that it was almost unenjoyable. Um, so we went back, we got some sleep, we hiked up and saw the grizzly giant, which is by far the most spectacular single giant sequoia that exists in the world. Um, and it exists in a grove of giant sequoias, but not a very impressive grove of giant sequoias until you get to the grizzly giant and you recognize like, oh, that's what ancient looks like. Um, and I don't have a picture of that on our social media, but I took some that I can show. Pictures don't do it justice, obviously, as they never do. But when we were hiking up to the grizzly giant, so we came in on snow on Friday, freezing temperatures, I think it was 12 degrees. Uh, Saturday, it started raining. So we hiked up to the grizzly giant in three feet of snow and torrential rain. We were soaked literally to the bone. Our boots were full of water. Our clothes were saturated to the skin. It was a seven mile round trip because the road was closed to hike into it. Uh, and it was epic. It was like the best, gnarliest thing ever. Uh, and then we ended up on, on yesterday, on Monday, going back into the valley on Monday, nobody there, supposed to be raining, clears up, blue skies, snow, sun, warmth, watched some people climb on El Capitan, uh, went through the valley at our leisure with nobody else around. It was freaking monumental and it reminded me of the trip to the Bristle Cones where nobody else was. It was just, sometimes life works out just the way it should. Um, I'm going to ask this, even though we're trying to keep questions very on topic to this Ponderosa, but um, Marsha wants to know if you saw any oaks while you drove down oh, yeah. California and, and what you thought about it. I mean, I love the oaks, but there's a particular spot, and, and we actually drove kind of near this because we went through the, we went out the north entrance. We came in the south entrance to hit Tunnel View. We went out the north entrance, which kind of takes you near Stockton. And uh, there's a very special place right along the foothills outside of Stockton that in my mind has the best oaks that I've seen in California in terms of their shape and structure. Um, we got to see a little bit of it before it got too dark as we were driving. But the, the oaks in California, in my mind, are equally as impressive as any other ancient or you know, extremely old, very characteristic tree in the California landscape. And um, I think, you know, Mr. Fujikawa continually said, what, what is that? And I said, that's an oak. So what is that? That's an oak, right? It had a big, big impression, I think, on both of us. ハポ落とせないのやつ。ああ、ああ、ああ。どう思いますか。あれもね、面白いなと思った。やっぱりその、なんだろう。日本は結構その柔らかあと、ああいう葉っぱがついてて、こう硬そうなやつっていうのはその、なんだろう、模様とかがこう中の自然の中にあるやっぱりその姿っていうのはあのこう自然の周りが本当に表現されてて、かっこいいな
だけ全部それを、うん、やってしまうとそのさあ一箇所に針金置いとけばいいよ、ねうん、その木のことを考えてあげることがやっぱりその盆栽のいいところなんだよね話聞くということはそういいところを出すなだけじゃなくて自分のエゴだけじゃなくて、うん、いやそれを考えてあげればあのいいことだから今日はここがもうこの木の一番いいその状態、うん、So he had so he said as far as further compacting and what not his feeling is For this tree today, this is, this is enough, and this is the best that can be done at this point in time. And he said, in, in terms of Japan, there's kind of a, a saying of you need to speak with the tree, but it's not in terms of the conversation, right? It's not in terms of like talking to the tree. It's more recognizing the limitations, understanding it's a living thing, and playing to its strengths and the maximum capacity that you can have an impact on the shape of that tree in any single. In any single piece of work.、Uh, and so he feels like this, in terms of listening to the tree and making decisions that are in its best interest, that we're not going to go any farther. And I would say I don't totally echo that、um, because we'll see what happens with the apex, and I see probably a little bit more compression, but、um, we'll have to work. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, Jason had pointed something out,、um, and this was from a few minutes ago. He says, Where Ryan is wiring, is that a former wire scar? The dark rings on the vertical branches. Right, yeah, great question. So, ponderosa pine in the natural environment grows incredibly slow. And, and what that means is, it's actually not a former wire scar, but what you start to see, and hey, Zeus, can you just zoom in right here and just show this area right here? I got it. Okay. So, when we start to look right here, you see these black rings, okay? Now, and you can see them less, less defined, but you can definitely see each of these pieces. Now, each of these is a year of growth. Each one of these sections is a year of growth. And because they grow so slowly in a really water constricted environment, you get very small flushes of growth each year. So, this branch is probably 20, 25 years old right here, okay? And so, when you see that, that's not a wire scar, it's just that evidence where it stopped one year and started the next. So, Farley wanted to follow up on their question.、Um, they said they might have used the wrong word when they said compaction. They meant, are you looking for back bedding to make the foliage pads more dense? Ah, of course. Always. Always. This is, the, this, is the, this is the complexity of ponderosa pine being worked out in its greatest form and degree. You have to get back budding. You're always trying to promote that. Now, the way that you do that. Is not plucking a lot of needles. You'll notice I'm plucking very few needles. This is something that's very difficult for somebody who comes from a bonsai practice where pine needles are plucked as a general practice. This is a conversation we've been having、um, because if you start to impair that needle mass that has the ability to create the sugars and starches that fuel the expansion of the vascular tissue, which is where the tree gets its confidence and knowledge. To be able to expand its photosynthetic mass with the expansion, with the unimpeded growth of that foliar mass, then you get back budding and you get back budding very profusely. And this tree is starting to back bud, having re established its roots after collection. Took it a little bit longer, an extra year to start back budding. Typically, you would see it in the fall of the year, that it,、uh, the second year after it's collected. This is now the fall of the third year. So inside of that, That just means that the tree wasn't ready, wasn't reestablished, needed to invest more in its root system, needed to invest more in terms of accumulation of energy. Now we're there, now it's starting to back bud. That's exactly what we want to see.、Uh, Dave wants to know what kind of container are you en、um, envisioning for this piece and why?、Um, you know, I haven't, given that, I haven't given that a whole heck of a lot of thought. And I, I, I will have to look at it after we're done、um, to really give a, an appropriate answer. So, I, I have this tree, honestly, if I'm just going to be completely honest, was a tree that probably was beyond the scale that was really sellable for Randy. And it was sitting out there, and I recognized in the structure of the vascular system and the bends that existed in the tree the capacity to really compress and compact the design. And I thought, how interesting would it be to apply? 
black pine to this in terms of grafting. Now the scale of the foliar mass on this tree is obviously capable of handling. The scale of the foliar mass is obviously capable of handling the ponderosa pine needle mass. I was thinking more in terms of really playing on sort of the natural bonsai characteristic that's going to exist in this design by the end of it in terms of its compression and compaction ability to potentially play on that concept um, and really use that to create a really big, massive grafted over black pine. Again, obviously I'm a huge proponent of ponderosa. It has nothing to do with my lack of love for the species. Don't read too much into that. It was more an experiment on a tree that probably didn't have a lot of probably didn't have a lot of commercial value. Can we play? Can we experiment? What would that look like to graft over a ponderosa of this size? I'm now, which always happens, you always fall in love with a tree that you put your hands on. I'm now very much interested in keeping it a ponderosa pine, which, you know, so goes the battle. Um, because it's beautiful and it's interesting. Uh, it's incredibly interesting. So we'll see. We'll see where the, where the future takes us with this. But um, having said that, the container selection was, is like the farthest thing from my mind right now. Um, John wants to know how ponderosa pines do in the southeast USA. You know, I, so my experience with ponderosa pines in the southeastern United States, I do believe Bjorn has ponderosa pines in Knoxville, I think I've at least heard and I've seen pictures of them. Um, I used to have a, a, a client, uh, Mike Blanton, in Nashville, Tennessee, that had ponderosa pines and they did great because they get cold. It gets cold there. And that's really what ponderosas need. They need cold, they need that dormancy. Um, I think if you go too deep into the southeastern United States, you get into potentially some of the northern portions of Louisiana. Um, I'm sure there's some colder portions of Alabama that might facilitate it and some that are too warm for it. So I think it depends on where you're at and what kind of nighttime temperatures you're getting, how long that prolonged cold is, how consistent it is, um, as to whether or not they can in fact be successful in that environment. But, um, but there are places in the southeastern United States where Ponderosa absolutely thrive. They just thrive. They love it. Uh, Matt wants to know, what is one thing that you and Mr. Fujikawa have learned from each other this week? One thing that you've each learned from the other? えっと、未来にいる間にはい、どこか一つだけの勉強ありましたか。うん。一つ、一つ言えばいいってこと？そうそうそうそう。うんとね、あ、あればね。あ、ありますよ。あの、日本はさ。ほら、日本が盆栽のスタートの場所って言うじゃない。はい。だからこれが盆栽だって日本が盆栽が本当本当とかスタートとか長いとかっていうのは簡単なんだよね。うん。だけどこれがいいとか悪いとかではなくてそ
pursuit of bonsai in all of its forms across deciduous, broadleaf, evergreen, and conifer. And um, just kind of reawakened my awareness and sense of that malleability and the opportunity to pursue that higher level of knowledge and higher level of, of craftsmanship um, that I think sometimes is maybe not as characteristic of Western cultures as it is of, uh, of such a disciplined shokunin based culture in Japan. And, and that's been really refreshing to, um, to sort of have that, have that brought, brought, brought back to the foreground of my mind. Not that, not that I've forgotten it, but sometimes you get lost in your own culture a little bit. And it's nice to have those reminders of those nuances that have made this art form so, I think, prominent and incredibly endearing to a worldwide culture. Um, as, it, as it was really, I think, pursued to the highest level that we've seen in the world yet in Japan. Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit, but just to make sure, Kevin wants to know, will this tree stay in your personal collection or is it for sale? <laughs> I mean, um, you Everything know, it kind of looks like sure. this. Um, bonsai is a profession for me, and so I can't be, I can't be super sentimental about it. Here's, here's where I find the actual attraction to a piece like this, is in the provenance that's created by this piece being a collaborative component between Mr. Fujikawa and myself. And one of the things that I think we, we, we maybe don't realize in our young bonsai culture is that the exchanging of ownership or the exchanging of hands of a tree only adds to the color and the quality and the depth of that piece as a little bit of a time capsule, as a, as a, as a preservative of the moment. And inside of that, I, I would be very happy for somebody else to have this and to carry it forward, to have put in, input into it, you know, collaborating with Mr. Fujikawa, and then to see that continue to be a collaborative piece that has more hands put on it over the course of time. I think the most devastating thing is when that happens and it's touched by maybe somebody who didn't fully appreciate the, the, the concepts that were invested or the level of the concepts that were invested. And I think this gives rise to some of the discussions that have been had on the podcast. Um, you know, there is an Australian podcast where we talked about sort of a museum piece. Is it preserved or is it continued to be improved and evolved? Because bonsai is always growing, it's very difficult to just hold it in that aesthetic. So then there's always this discussion of, should you change the original artist's concept? And I believe you should. Uh, but I think in doing that, there's a maturity to evolving a shape and design. There's a humility in not making it about yourself. And I think we're just starting to exercise those muscles that have been a very significant and continual part of bonsai in Japan as just an aspect of the art form that has existed. There's still bonsai from um, some of the shoguns. There's still historical pieces that carry with it the significance of the country in terms of its history. We're just learning about that, and that's a muscle we've got to further really exercise in order to be able to do bonsai to the best of our ability. Um. This is a ponderosa question. Um, Wayne wants to know how much cold do ponderosas need? Yeah, that's, so this is a really tough thing to answer. I think there are factual pieces of information out there, although they do tend to differ depending on the, depending on the subspecies um, and depending on the source of information. Um, it's actually a relatively low quantity of cold. I believe it's, I believe it's something like, um, and don't quote me on this, because this is just giving you a sample of what it might sound like. Uh, but there are these figures out there, particularly with the USDA or US uh, Forest Service. Um, might be something like 60 or 80 hours below um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit might satisfy the dormancy requirement. Now, is there more value to colder temperatures? Yes. And does that mean that you can have more severe temperatures for shorter periods of time and satisfy that dormancy? It does. Um, but what that equation ultimately works out to and how anybody really knows is still, to me, a mystery and maybe one of the unsolved riddles of the ge geographic range of a lot of our native species. Um, so from that perspective, Duane, I, I, I honestly don't know, but I think it's somewhere in the realm of 90 to 120 of hours below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Are you ready for some more questions or should we pause? Go ahead. I think we're just kind of rocking and rolling. All right, cool. Um, Marsha wants to know if Mr. Fujikawa also has a horticultural degree or a background similar to yours. あの、富士川さんは園芸、はい。勉強したりますか園芸のその、うんと、木の、木のことあの、もうちょっと学問として。うん、そうそうそう。学問としてはそんなには勉強してないね。あ、そう。ただ、その、うんと、いつもこう
I think he just answered that, which is to say, like, it's young, it's fresh, it's got a lot of youthful vigor and energy. There's a lot of probably ignorance that leads to a lot of bliss. Um, whereas Japanese bonsai has been pursued at a very high level for a long time, and inside that there's maturity, there's uh, an amount of information, <clears throat> their starting point is higher, there's an accepted and inset knowledge that exists, but also inside of that maturity there can be a complacency, and right now he feels there is a complacency that's lost some of that power of the inspiration of a little bit more youthful, juvenile, or at least a a more energetic approach to the art form that he would like to see or at least be a part of bringing back to bonsai in Japan. Yeah, and I know he gave a great answer to this question last week too. So if you guys are interested in hearing more about yeah, that, he did, that he? Is, is, is in last week's stream as well. Um, so Jeff wants to know, what are your and Fujikawa's opinions on if this tree could eventually be shown in the top level Japanese bonsai shows after it's finished, like not worrying about import mm. bans? Yeah. この木はあの、材料的にね。うん。そのトップクラス、例えば日本とかアメリカ。トップクラスの材料ですかうん。So he said, you know, maybe there's better trees in the United States or in Europe or or somewhere else, but from, from his perspective, this tree is definitely sort of in that upper upper class or echelon of trees in terms of its capacity on a, on a, on a big scale to be a very powerful, significant piece. Uh, he was drawn to this the very first day, which we, we, needed, we, we needed some repetition on Ponderosa before we bit this off. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave wants to know, will Mr. Fujikawa's time at Mirai and in the US landscape have an impact on future scopes of work he will undertake when he goes back to Japan, what does that look like? あの、盆栽あ、そういうことではなくてもっと広い世界の盆栽になっていかないとあの、もっとそういう可能性があるあの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、
Sure. But he started thinking, what happens if Japan takes on a more worldwide collaborative kind of approach and opens their thought process and maybe inside of Japan collaborates a little bit more and the power that that could bring and also maybe a little bit of a revolution to that more, I would say, sort of complacent perspective and approach to the art form. どこで下げるよこのまままっすぐここで下げるそうそうそうそうここでねいいんじゃない十六、うん、十六でこれ十分じゃない十四じゃあ十四でこれでじゃないですかじゃあ長さどこまでここまでそこじゃなくてこ,これが硬いああそうかそうかはい Ready for some more questions? これか Yeah Uh, ben wants to know Is there another genre of plants that Mr. Fujikawa enjoys, like orchids, cacti, succulents, etc.? Bonsai, Janakte, Hokono, Shokubutsu, Omoshiroi, Tomoteru, Shokubutsu, Arimaska, Tatova, Sabakuni, Sunderu, Yatuka, Tropicuru, no Yatuka. Bonsai, no Kanke, Janakte, Tada, Ua, Omoshiroi, Nato, Moma, Shokubutsu. So, Arimasio, Yapari. その形が特別なものがやっぱりその場所でしか生きない形のものっていうのはすごく特別ですから面白いよね、うん、でも防災にあこれなるかなとかちょっと考えちゃうけどね。<笑> He said there are particularly pieces where it's like it, it can only live in this environment this very special environment has, has a real power and interest to him but he said his, his natural go to is always to wonder could, could you make a bonsai with it? <笑> Which,、uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to see. Ryan, s a g e t i Dai de Mitio, so chide. Yo. Stop, stay. Hi, all right, all right, all right, yo. Mo, Kimata. So it's interesting to talk with him because obviously the succulents have become kind of like a, a thing that Mariah is experimenting with. There is a unity, there is like a, a consistency to the thought process of being exposed to this wonderful world of plants in this manner that we are. Really, caretakers and stewards of these pieces, and、uh, to, to know that that spans other bonsai cultures to me is a, is a very beautiful aspect of how bonsai can open all of our awareness to plants and the power of our relationship to those plants. Matt would like to know what is Mr. Fujikawa's favorite tree that he has seen at Mirai? Bonsai Mirai ni ichiban daiski na ki arimasu ka? ありますよでもね心拍はやっぱり日本にもあるけどそのワイルドさがいいけど、うん、やっぱりこのポンデロッサとかの,あの形は結構違うんだよね、うん、日本と、うん、だからそういう木がやっぱりねあいいなって思っちゃうね、うんうん、なるほど心拍はもうすごくいいよワイルドでね。So he said he loves the wild. Flavor and feel of our junipers. But he said there's something about the ponderosas and the lodge poles and the limber pines, just the, the wildness, the ruggedness of our pines that doesn't exist. Whereas there's rugged junipers in Japan, maybe a little bit different or maybe not as many, or you know, there's nuances to that. But that wild pine vibe has really got, it's really kind of where he's, where he's jiving the most. Uh, Rafi wants to know if there's a chance that you'll need to bend down that branch sticking up、uh, to connect the、uh, top and bottom. This, this that one, or、yes. this?、Uh, the one that's the tall one. Yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not there yet. Okay. You know me, and we're never going to style an apex straight up in there. We just did a whole stream on how we don't do that. True. <laughs> Rafi, come on, Rafi. You know, <laughs> you know, you know. And just so you know, we are two hours in. 2時間足りました。足したあと少しね。うん。We're almost done. Oh, yeah. It wasn't about that. I just figured you might want to know. うん。How's it look? Coming along, huh? So, Rafi would like to clarify. He's talking about connecting the top and bottom, and the apex is already there. Ah,、uh, so, so, yeah, I don't know. We're going to have to see what happens here. There are going to be some 
What would, what, how could I say this? There are going to be some accepted discrepancies and opinions of things. That's part of collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. Other, otherwise, if you were just going to do it the way you wanted to do it, you wouldn't work together and call it a collaboration. So it's going to be interesting to see when we finish up. I think we'll probably both step back and have a little bit of a conversation from a greater perspective, because this is a big tree. And we're, we're up in its business right now. And so it's hard to have a really good idea or awareness of Wouldn't it just suck to break the apex off right now? Yeah, that'd be pretty bad. Yeah. これ <laughs> Leonard wants to know, would wrapping branches uh, with this kind of bark with raffia, would that destroy the value and take years to rebuild? It would, it would take time. It wouldn't take years because ponderosa is a really aggressive species, which means it thickens very quickly. And in that thickening process, particularly in domestic cultivation, it produces very rugged bark very, very quickly. The bark amasses very quickly. Um, Again, the raffia doesn't serve much of a purpose in this type of a tree because it tears instead of breaks. And inside of that, you really want to be watching those tears to be able to make the right decisions um, in terms of thresholds for bending tolerance. Uh, and I think that's where, that's where you're definitely not seeing us apply raffia like ever. You'll never see me apply raffia on a ponderosa. I don't know that I've ever done that in any stream or even on any tree in the garden. Um, maybe, maybe the first year I was back, I put raffia on a ponderosa, and then I was like, why, why, am I, why am I doing that? It definitely mars the bark, but more than anything, I can't see, and you see, you see this in Europe a lot. They put raffia on all of their Scots pine, their, their sylvestris, and that's a tree that stretches. It can break. It's a little bit more fragile than a ponderosa, but not much, and a lot of times it tears because they bend it so much and they can't see it, and that's actually what causes the demise of Sylvestris, particularly during, during demos where they're trying to max out the appearance of the finished product. I think you know, there has to at some point be an awareness of the characteristics of the tree and its tolerances and the best ways to work with it to be able to accurately and adequately identify those tolerances. Um, for the Ponderosa, that aspect is definitely enabled by an awareness of how that tissue is tearing. がきれいかどうかって問題。うん、そうでもないと思う。返すから。はい。あ、ちょっと待って。うん、ちょっと逃がした方がいい。こっちに。行きますよ。
これとこれかけてもらっていいですか、うん、分かったこの二つ上の二つねそうなんかね、腰パッとしてと一番綺麗になるかもしれないよと思うんだよ Ready for another question? Ready Uh, Scott wants to know Do either of you feel that you have to hold back or put more thought into some of the design ideas while working together, or is this just second nature to you from studying under the same master? So he said it's not necessarily a, a, a matter of holding back or showing any sort of restraint. It's more about listening to each other and communicating as we're doing it, having that, that avenue of communication open so that we're making decisions that we both are, are maybe aware of. The Tabum, go, Otagai no Ike, mo. あの違うこともあると思うけどそんなに違うってこともないね。If we made it, if we made this tree independently, there's a strong chance there would be some differences. But probably, and, and this is particularly for this piece that has a, I would say a more traditional slant on the design. Our, our, our ideas and the design would probably be relatively similar or at least close in terms of its relationship. いやいやいや悪くないよ。これはこのたくさこれも、うん、もちろん、そうだね。もっと下げないとダメですね。そうだねこのぐらいもうちょっと。いや、これはもう。引っ張れないの。いや引っ張るわけないただこう,こうなってるから気をつけないと。もうちょっとで終わりだね。ちょっと待ってね。Uh, Rafi wants to know are the concepts of harmonious tension and dynamic design concepts、uh, common to all Kimura students or something that you developed after leaving Japan? Yeah, they're not con- they're not concepts from my apprenticeship. They're concepts that I developed to quantify and teach design in a way that wasn't so arbitrary.、Uh, so there's no, there is no quantification of that or discussion of that. It doesn't exist, but it is interesting. You know, I, I think one thing about the American culture is we thrive on explanation and knowledge. Uh, and asking why. And in asking why, one of the things about being a teacher, if you choose to try and educate people about your process, is you have to be able to quantify why. So I do see a lot of actions being made that I think are of the same spirit, but maybe not necessarily have the same level of understanding of why, because asking why when you're an apprentice is not, not something that you do. Uh, Jonathan wants to know Did Mr. Kimura allow you guys to collaborate like this when you were apprenticing? Probably wasn't time,、no. but yeah. No. Ryan, so you're here? Hmm. This is a little bit of a cold. So, this is a little bit of a cold. 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 でもその向きでこう,こう,う、うん、そうそうそうそうそれそれちょっと見ててそこでストップして俺巻くから、はい、Apex a little too big いやかっこいいじゃんどううんそれの方がいいねこんな感じかな
Um, Grayson said that you mentioned you were originally going to graft this tree. In general, would you style this first and then graft yes. if that was the plan? Yes. So this is one of the interesting discoveries that we've made about grafting in particular is if you lay it out, you take all of that auxin that suppresses lateral bud growth. And when you take that out, uh, when you take that oxen out, so you've got, you've got all these branches growing up, and everybody says, okay, I'm going to graft here, I'm going to let this grow, right, and elongate, but this oxen is suppressing the success of that graft. When you lay that down, you allow cytokinin to flow into that branch. Cytokinin is what stimulates the growth of the buds that have occurred because of your vascular productivity and creates lateral branching. So just by the act of lowering a branch, you automatically increase back budding by changing that hormonal distribution. So when you graft, that graft is equivalent to a back bud, right? It's potential, but it's not actualized. And if you lower that and then you come back in and graft, you've got a hormonal content that will increase the success of grafting dramatically. We've seen this across ponderosas at Mirai. Styled ponderosas, we can get upwards of 90%. We've even hit 100 on a few trees, which is almost unheard of on a ponderosa. Unstyled, 50% at best, and oftentimes not even 50%. So, something interesting. Do you want to go? This is what I want to go to. I'm asking him why he had those up, and he's saying he thinks that they're not necessary. こっちに。そう、わかる。ここのさ、流れが消えるかなと思って、こっち側の。伸びすぎと。うん。うん、違うの。あの、こっちに出な、出なくなると頭の流れが消えそうだったからやんなかった。うん。So we're just talking about this area right here and I said how come you didn't drop this? Cuz this area right here is particularly thick and I wanted to hide it and he said it feels weird to him to have one branch hanging down below the others. I said, this is kind of ponderosa. He also said, I didn't want it to change the flow of the apex having this, this rightward movement. Yeah. This area is super thick. I think it's valuable. I don't know. These are all the things we can come back and kind of work with later on. どう。いいじゃない。うん。その方が自然な感じするね。ちょっと空間は空いていいと思うよ。これでいい。うん。じゃあ、オープニングアップ ね。うん。そしてね。ちょっとそっちから見ると。どう。そんなに変わらないかな。もう一回やって。後ろからできる。So I'm trying to compress this as he's looking at it. He's saying do it again. ああ、そうだね。so we're trying to get that flow of the apex to the right. And just by compressing this, it pulls this upper side down, raises this up, and changes that. これは元々中に入ってたから。こっち、こっちに入ってたのか。そうそう。こうにして、うん。
。これが今度下がってきたから。これを上げないと。Matt's wondering if we could put something white behind that lower section so we can see the branch structure better. David says lowering that branch helps to bring the upper and lower foliage masses together. Oh no. <laughs> I don't know how valuable this is going to be because there's holes cut in it. Thanks, Apical Formation. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Eve and Chucho. My, <laughs> thanks for ruining my bed sheets. Yeah, I'm a guy. Dude, God. No, I got it. As good as you're going to get right there. <laughs> そうだね、ポイントはこことここを見せるのと、so, あとここを隠すのだよね。So he wants to show that upper bend, he wants to show that piece of shari on the trunk. We want to, we want to hide that, that thicker piece where the two components split apart. I love the movement down through this lower branch. We'll turn that into a gin. We'll continue to work, strengthen that lower piece that's giving a lot of flow. そうですね。あれです。お疲れ様でした。お疲れ様でした。<笑> yeah, really, really interesting、uh, to be a part of. Definitely like the give take of collaboration and the push pull and then the exchange of ideas and also having that synergy between the two of us of having worked together and really interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed this.、Um, oh, Josh, can you show us the before? I was gonna cut、so、in、so. in a sec. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, changed a lot. Changed、sure、a lot.、Did. This tree had the capacity to be something very special. The base, it's tough to see. There's soil, there's box, but we will, we will definitely get there. A nice transformation, though. Yeah, very cool. Yeah,、uh, It's been a real pleasure to have Mr. Fujikawa at Mirai.、Um, <clears throat> he was kind of the apprentice,、uh, Mr. Fujikawa and Mr. Rushibata, who really helped me develop myself as a person and as a bonsai professional during my studies, obviously. So、um, I'm extremely grateful. Hontoni, domo, arigato gozaimashita. Kocho yo koso. Tanoshikata desu. It was a good time. Uh, anyways, thank you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Sorry to go over. Hope you enjoyed it. A lot of stuff to digest here. Watch this one again, it'll be up Thursday.、Um, support the、uh, PBM book if you guys can and have the, the desire to.、Uh, huge project that we can lend our strength to.、Um, I think we all give Mr. Fujikawa a round of applause for everything that he's done for us. And、uh, we wish him safe travels on his way home. Thank you guys for the support. We love you very much. Couldn't do it without you. We'll see you on Thursday. If not, we've got something special for you next week. Woo! All right. Have a great night, guys. Mwah! <laughs>